Hello. Okay, <clears throat> so it is four o'clock. Uh, Ma'am, can we begin now? Yeah, I, I think so. We can start. Okay. Uh, so, good evening, all the participants, and welcome to the mathematics webinar series seven uh, on teaching mathematics with a multidisciplinary perspective. Uh, I would request uh, Dr. Susama Samuel, Principal of Saint Xavier's Institute of Education, to welcome all of us. Over to Dr. Sosama. So, uh, good evening, everyone, and a warm uh, welcome to St. Xavier's Institute of Education. Our manager, Father uh, uh, Blaise de Sousa, uh, my uh, colleagues, faculty members, students, and participants uh, uh, from um, different parts of our country, different parts of our state, all are welcome to this uh, webinar series. Welcome to St. Xavier's Institute of Education once again. Good evening, ma'am. Yeah. Yeah. This webinar uh, series, um, the main uh, topic is uh, topic for this is teaching uh, strategies and solutions for boosting mathematics. This webinar uh, series is an initiative of our mathematics pedagogy unit, uh, which is uh, headed by Dr. Uh, Bini Sebastian, associate professor from our institute, and the team of uh, mathematics uh, pedagogy students. Uh, there are seven students are also a part of this uh, webinar uh, series. Uh, it is a uh, monthly webinar series. Monthly, there is uh, one uh, session based on mathematics uh, and uh, subjects related to mathematics. And the main uh, purpose of this webinar is to promote mathematics and to develop interest in mathematics and to reduce the difficulties of the students related to mathematics and to make uh, mathematics more creative, more interesting to students as well as teachers. Uh, this is the uh, seventh uh, session and the seventh uh, session related to this uh, webinar series. The past uh, six uh, sessions, so six uh, series dealt with various uh, pedagogies uh, of mathematics. Some of the uh, sessions dealt with some research uh, products, uh, the findings of the research. And uh, some of them uh, were like, mostly it is, uh, it was based on the pedagogies of innovations or pedagogies of for mathematics to develop interest in mathematics. And the resource persons, uh, the last uh, series uh, were from uh, 
college teachers uh, from schools, ex expert experts or teachers from schools, as well as from colleges, as well as uh, from uh, various institutes, like you know, some of them were from Indian Institute of Technology, IIT, and uh, some were from Homi Baba Center for Science Education. So uh, this webinar series uh, is for the last uh, seven, six months, uh, it is running very successfully. And uh, the purpose of, or the objective of this uh, uh, webinar is to promote mathematics or to develop interest in mathematics in students as well as in teachers. And today's uh, topic for the session is uh, something which is very important. You can say that the current uh, topic that is teaching maths with a multidisciplinary perspective. Uh, as we all know that uh, the most uh, distinguished quality of mathematics is that uh, mathematics is an integral part of our life and an unavoidable part of our life, as well as it is an integral part of any subject. Mathematics is essential in our life, as well as mathematics is essential in developing any other subject. Sometimes mathematics is a tool uh, sometimes mathematics uh, is a discipline, sometimes uh, mathematics is a pedagogy, sometimes mathematics uh, is an innovation, sometimes mathematics is related with values. So we can say that mathematics is everything. Or one thing we can say that mathematics is an ingredient of any product. So whatever product you see that mathematics is a part of any product or mathematics is a product is, is a part of any finished work. So today, Dr. Uh, Hanit Gandhi will share her uh, knowledge and her experience with us in this subject. I think multidisciplinary approach, she is very much interested in sharing her knowledge with us. Today's her topic is teaching mathematics in a multidisciplinary perspective. Uh, let us all, let us together welcome Dr. Gandhi to this session. And uh, uh, also I welcome uh, our mathematics unit uh, head in charge, Dr. Vinnie Sebastian and her team of students. When she started uh, this uh, webinar series, uh, we started with a, uh, uh, with a lecture series or a presentation. But, uh, but after some time, now uh, she has also put some innovation in this. And now uh, she has taken up a need-based research uh, along with this. So I think monthly, uh, this uh, team conducts uh, a need-based research. And also, I, I hope that at the end of the session, she share the findings with us. So uh, uh, good going uh, for mathematics unit, uh, Dr. Vinny Sebastian and uh, your team of students. So I appreciate on behalf of the Institute for the good work you are doing. So all the best uh, to all the participants and all the best to Dr. Gandhi and all the best to uh, Dr. Vinny Sebastian and team of students. So over to Dr. Vinny. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, before I start, Alsona, father is waiting in the wait, uh, waiting room. So can you please look out for father, please? Yes, ma'am, okay. Okay. Uh, so thank you, ma'am, for your uh, uh, motivating words. And uh, ma'am has always been very motivating to the mathematics unit and that has helped us to move forward till now. Uh, so uh, as ma'am has already given us a background, SXIE has, uh, St. Xavier's Institute of Education, the, ma the Mathematics Pedagogy Unit, has been organizing these webinars on strategies and solutions for boosting mathematics learning. Uh, we have been doing this since June 2020, and we have garnered a lot of interest in this mathematics webinars because uh, when we did not have it in December, I got a number of calls saying that, ma'am, why, why have you not had uh, it in this uh, month, you know, we really wanted to uh, hear this uh, any on a topic of interest of our interest in mathematics subject. So I think we have done a good job, and uh, uh, by conducting these webinars, we hope and pray that there are some changes that are happening in the attitude and perception of mathematics teachers, and some innovative pedagogies have been practiced in the schools and colleges. So we are truly grateful to all the resource persons, the participants, and uh, all the institutions that have collaborated with us 
for organizing this webinar series. We have really got a very positive response every time when we have organized these webinars. And this time we have got over 700 participants who have registered for this webinar. We request you to share your one minute video of your innovation uh, on um, uh, the mathematics learning uh, Essex at sxie.in. The email ID is provided to you. So please share your one minute video. We would be uploading it on our mathematics channel. It is an open educational resource and it can be of use for everyone. The, this meeting will be recorded and it will be uploaded on our YouTube channel, Mathematics Learning. So do subscribe to our YouTube channel. This effort would not be successful if we did not have our own students standing by us. So I am really grateful to our student team, Riesel and Alsona, who are the co-hosts for today. Clarice, Nisha, Rachel and Vaseem who will be helping today. And we also have Daya who is not present, but she has been helping in our mathematics webinar. So today we bring to you an innovative perspective, teaching maths with a multidisciplinary perspective by Dr. Hanid Gandhi. So before we get into the session, I would request Riesel to introduce Dr. Hanid Gandhi for us. Over to Riesel. Yes, thank you, Vinny, ma'am. Good evening, everyone. Today, we are privileged to have with us Dr. Hanid Gandhi to speak on teaching mathematics with a multidisciplinary perspective. Dr. Hanid Gandhi is a faculty in the Department of Education, University of Delhi, and is an expert in mathematics education and quantitative research methods. Ma'am has completed master's in mathematics from IIT Delhi and PhD in mathematics education from Lucknow University. Dr. Hanit Gandhi has authored several books on the teaching of mathematics. The famous among them is the series on hands-on mathematics for middle school children. As an academician, Ma'am wishes to break the myths related to fear of mathematics by connecting ideas in an easily comprehensible way. Ma'am has, to her credit, many national as well as international publications in reputed journals that are widely referred to. Dr. Gandhi has also held many important positions at the University of Delhi. In 2019, Ma'am was appointed as the co convener for revising all undergraduate and postgraduate programs under the learning outcome approach of UGC. Currently, Ma'am is appointed as a deputy dean in the admission branch of University of Delhi and is handling admissions for the current academic year 2020-21. Ma'am, we are delighted and pleased to have you with us this evening. Once again, a warm welcome on behalf of St. Xavier's Institute of Education and a kind request to begin your session. Over to you, ma'am. Thank you so much. Uh, am I visible and am I audible? Yes, yes. Yes, ma'am. Okay. Uh, so thank you so much uh, uh, to the St. Xavier's Institute for inviting me in these web series. In fact, uh, very recently I came across this institute and I'm <coughs> privileged and also I'm extremely excited and honored to be part of these web series, especially something related to maths education because not <coughs> many people work in this area. You know, I mean, uh, now I see an upsurge in uh, on the works related to maths education, but for a very long time uh, there were hardly people who would work in, who were working in this area. So I'm very excited, and my congratulations to uh, St. Xavier's College of Education and particularly to the Mathematics Pedagogy Department for taking this initiative, inviting uh, people like us to be connected with your institute, knowing you and uh, knowing other people. As you said, there are around 700 participants. That's huge and that's really uh, uh, you know applaudable uh, on your team's part that your students and all of you are working as a team to make uh, such webinars successful and 700 people across country which is which will span across teachers and students and i'm sure teacher educators so you're doing a great job in educating people especially in maths education which is which has not been 
I would say it's been a slightly unexplored area. You know, not many people work diligently in this area. So I'm really happy and many, many congratulations uh, my, with my folded hands to all of you who are working in this field and promoting mathematics uh, education. Uh, so I'll um, uh, begin my presentation. There are a couple of things I think I'm supposed to do. So let me just do those little, uh, uh, can you please uh, allow me to uh, share my screen? You can share now. Right. Um, so, uh, you know, just to give you a little background on what I'll be talking about, I will be soon sharing my uh, PowerPoint presentation that I made specially for this uh, webinar today. But most importantly, that uh, has been a concern, and people who I can request them to look into it. How we understand mathematics and mathematics. Um, okay, uh, so uh, you know we need to really do a lot of research as well. Please uh, mute your mics, participants. Please mute your mics. Uh, yes, ma'am. Please continue. Thank you. So, uh, they, you know, we definitely need we need research in uh, in in maths education per se, particularly to our uh, to particularly the context of our country. Uh, when we look at researches done in this area, most of them we have to rely to the researches which have been done outside our country, and sometimes they don't help in in making out sense of it or you know contextualizing it. So uh, my earnest request to all the participants who are here today is to please uh, look into thematic things, look into the conceptualization of mathematical concepts, look into how we can build this uh, learning of mathematics amongst our children. You know, we've had such a rich culture. If you go abroad or, you know, if you go somewhere abroad deaf, and you say you're from India, the first thing that comes to their mind is that, you know, we're good in mathematics. But uh, in the late few years, we're seeing that this is dipping. The love for mathematics or we as Indians, uh, you know, we, we kind of, the passion for doing mathematics is kind of declining. I think it is, it is for us now to look into and introspect why it is being done. Anyways, today we, I have something else to share, which is on multidisciplinary perspective. And uh, is my screen, uh, can I, sh okay, one minute. So let me just share my screen. Share the computer sound also, ma'am. Yes, thank you for reminding. And are the annotations also off? Any idea? Let me just close the annotations as well. Okay, can you see my screen? Yes, ma'am. Yeah. Right. Is it full length now? Yes. Okay. So um, the topic that I'm going to talk today is about um, teaching mathematics with a multidisciplinary perspective. Now, uh, there is a term which is being used here, multidisciplinary. And, uh, you know, since we're all teachers and we love to talk in our classrooms, this online teaching or, you know, online talking doesn't seem to be too enthusiastic. So I request you all and I request the organizer to open the chat boxes and please tell me because my, uh, you know, I won't be able to look at the chat boxes and my screen is on. And this would be a two way process. I will post certain things and I'll wait for you to chat and to give certain responses. When I've got a handful of responses, I'll move ahead. So that's how I'm going to take this uh, talk today. Uh, so today we are going to talk about how to teach mathematics from a multidisciplinary perspective. But to do that, we need to first understand this term multidisciplinary. What do we mean by multidisciplinary? So I throw, the, so throw this question to the house. There are three terms which come very close to each other. One is interdisciplinary, multidisciplinary, and transdisciplinary. So, um, or this, please help me. Should we take it in the chat box, or shall we let the uh, people allow uh, them to use their mics? But I want you to please tell me some key things on, you know, how do you differentiate between them? Uh, what do you mean by multidisciplinary, interdisciplinary, 
and transdisciplinary. Being in education, it is extremely important for us to discriminate or at least understand these three terms. So organizers, please help me. Uh, how do we take this ahead? Shall I? Yes, participants can unmute themselves or they can write on the chat. We have uh, Nisha and Rachel who will be helping you to see what is on the chat. Nisha and Rachel, would you be helping, ma'am? Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. So I request the participants, uh, you can even pick up, I've been told that this is coming live on YouTube. So um, if you have any idea, if you do not get any responses, then I will move ahead. But let me wait for a couple of seconds to get some, uh, uh, some feedback or some responses from the participants. How do you understand these three terms? Uh, you know, how do you look at these three terms? Ma'am, there are a lot of responses. Okay. So ma'am, uh, they have told that multidisciplinary means involvement with students in all topics. Okay. The other person has told multidisciplinary means people from different disciplines working together, each drawing on their disciplinary knowledge. They have told interdisciplinary means integrating knowledge and methods from different disciplines using a real synthesis of approaches and Transdisciplinary means creating a unity of intellectual frameworks beyond the disciplinary perspectives. Great, great. I hope people are not picking up from the YouTube, uh, sorry, from the Google. I hope they are like all understanding what they're saying because then I can delve into the various terminologies that they're using. But yes, even if you're Googling, it is fair enough. And these are fairly good ideas that we've got. Any more responses? Uh, there are responses from the YouTube. So, Rachel and Nisha, would you be able to pick up that? Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Uh, in YouTube, uh, people are saying that interdisciplinary means maths in accounts and economics. Okay. Someone says uh, it means uh, the same disciplines while interdiscipline means in the same discipline while multidisciplinary in multiple disciplines. Okay. Uh, Poonam says multidisciplinary basically mm -hmm. to coordinate or bring core relationships among teaching learning process. Okay. And another response is multidisciplinary is related to several branches. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah. So very close answers. I'm very glad that people are writing very closely knitted answers. Uh, yes, uh, these terms are similar. So let me just clarify that for the people who have uh, not participated or they have any confusion uh, in it. Uh, you see, interdisciplinary would mean that within a discipline itself, you are looking into the connections in a very lay person manner, if I could tell you. I, I mean, I'm talking to people who've just entered into the field of education. Let me bring it to that level. So when you're looking, which means in, in, three, in all three of them, you need to first understand what do we mean by a discipline? You know, there, there, are, there, there is a framework, there is a structure which defines a discipline. So if you understand what you mean by discipline and you understand what do, what do you, how do you inculcate that habit of, of uh, working into that discipline, only then you'll be able to understand these three terms, inter, multi, and trans, because you know these are like adverbs adding to that noun of discipline. So first and foremost, you need to understand the paradigms of a discipline. What makes the structure? What is the nature of a discipline? Mathematics has a very unique structure. In fact, you know, you would ever, you would always get into this kind of um, debate whether maths is an art or maths is science. You know, you always, I mean, I, this is the first assignment that I give it to my BA students that please write a write up on whether you think maths is an art or maths is a science. So I give them examples to think mathematics as an art. You know, so if we first draw, what do you mean by a discipline, an art discipline, and what do you mean by a science discipline? I don't want, I'm not going to give you the answers because I want you to look into it from your own perspective. But it's very important that you first understand mathematics is as a discipline. Is mathematics more towards humanity arts or is mathematics more towards sciences or does it have 
a unique structure of its own once you've understood for me i think it has a unique structure of its own and i have my reasons which i'm going to tell i mean i'm going to delve into those in my presentations i'm going to use all that what i'm saying how why i think that maths has a maths is neither a science nor an art it takes it from there but it has a, it's a unique way of doing things it's extremely abstract it's a matter of mind it delves into the mind we work from our mind and then we start working in an abstract way there is a principle of logic which which builds on to the mathematics there is an inductive process there is also a deductive process you know all these things are very important in the disciplinary attire of mathematics so after you understood you know what do we mean by mathematics per se as a discipline then you understand what is it connected with you know what are the traits that mathematics share with other disciplines so to that extent you can talk about let's say physics sometimes this way maths is more related or bent towards physics or physics is more bent towards mathematics if you take that those as a disciplinary uh, uh, affirmations then probably you're talking about an interdisciplinary approach however if you take physics arts and sciences as something separate from the disciplinary structure of mathematics then whatever you would be doing you'll be talking about a multidisciplinary uh, approach because now you will look into all these disciplines as distinctly featured so you'll talk about physics as a, as as a distinct feature in all together chemistry has a dis distinct disciplinary aspect you uh, sciences will have a distinct disciplinary aspect languages will have a distinct disciplinary aspect and when you try to make connections between all these and mathematics then you take as a distinct disciplinary aspect and if you try to bridge all of them then perhaps what you're trying to bring out is a multidisciplinary aspect transdisciplinary aspect you know it's like transmorphifying so you're talking about something which comes out new from all these associations for example artificial intelligence is now being talked as a transdisciplinary aspect it draws from various discipline but it is now building up into a new discipline of its own and there there could be you know after a couple of years we might see um uh, artificial intelligence as built up in a unique discipline way again you know and then you might say that this has emerged as a discipline so that there there is blurredness in these terms it depends so you know how you bring it up but the foremost thing is to understand what is your understanding of a discipline so i urge you if you are not too familiar with this term of discipline and you do not know how to justify or differentiate between discipline and subject first and the foremost thing for you to do is to you know read some good books on education and clarify this thought any person who is in in the field of education or even general must be able to differentiate between or must be able to identify the structure and nature of a discipline i mean i can't go on and on because i have to do many things but what i want to here emphasize is please understand the aspect of discipline and then only you'll be able to understand what do you mean by inter multi or transdisciplinary in this presentation or in the next one and a half hours that i have i will be focusing more on multidisciplinary which means for me my understanding is that maths has a distinct feature and other subjects also have some features and i'm going to take a amalgamation of these it's like you know i'm going to try to merge out or bring out mathematics from these different areas which means that i'll have to give you examples from how maths is a product is a by product or could be bring brought out from other subjects mm -hmm. we have to see when we are looking at a relationship between the two then i will have to bring out in a multidisciplinary sometimes maths would be feeding into that discipline sometimes i will be taking things from that discipline and bringing it into mathematics so if you understand this little uh, framework in your mind then things would be easy that's one second caveat to my presentation before i begin is i'm going to throw many examples to you all right and as dr vini has said i would urge after looking at the youtube you bring out certain or you know you take these ideas and then make some lesson plans or see how you can bring out these uh, ideas and uh, take it to your children and bring out your lesson plans how how would your pedagogy what would your pedagogy of course i will bring out some uh, nuances of making a lesson plan but ultimately it is the teacher who is empowered to take these ideas and build on it so you can take this as a project once you've seen these examples that i share these are just glimpses you know internet is full of examples 
but I'm going to show you another perspective of using these examples. There is obviously, you know, you just have to read and connect mathematics with it. Once you get the knack of it, then see how you can bring these perspective or make lesson plans for your students. Now, each of these ideas can be used at any level. You can see from class three to class, let's say, middle school, 10th and 11th, you can use any of these ideas, depending about how much rigor you would like to bring, how much profoundness you would like to bring, you can use any of these ideas. So I'm going to give you like a buffet of ideas and you can then, you know, it's up to you to pick whatever and, you know, explore the world around them. Okay, so um, as we were looking, you know, I would like to start this idea of why we need to look at mathematics from a multidisciplinary perspective. We need to go and look into the history. Um, history, if you look back, you know, once you look into the evolution of ideas, while I'm talking about history, I'm not talking about historians. I'm talking about evolution of ideas. So for example, if you look at how mathematics or disciplines emerged, how the concepts emerged uh, in the past, then you would understand what the need of being uh, a wider and thinking about from a multidisciplinary perspective. No subject emerged in isolation. If you go to the ancient history, let's say about ancient Indian history, you, you know, these, the, the examples that you see in my screen are all talking about mathematics. If you look at the left-hand side, there is an altar you know, people used to do a lot of yugs and a lot of things they used to do in the ancient India, especially down south. And, you know, there, were, there was a need to do all these religious and rituals exercises. There was very fine tuned um, ideas that would be bringed up. Then they used to make these altars on, their, um, on the ground. And it, it, it involved a lot of mathematics, including Pythagoras theorem or including, you know, where is the direction of the sun? Uh, where, which, where do you, how do you make perfect angles? How do you make perfect uh, uh, squares? How do you then study uh, the motion of the planets? And you know, where, in which direction should you place it? Now, there is a lot of literature available on this, but the, and, and similarly, if you look at the right hand side, that is the building of uh, Jantar Mantar in Delhi. You know, so they were capturing the motion of sun. They were seeing how you know they can time, they can find time as accurately by just looking at the motion of sun. Now in India, uh, we needed we the kind. If you go a little into the uh, the evolution of ideas, you would say that there were four dominant civilization. There was this Indus Valley civilization, Egyptian civilization, Mayan civilization, Babylonian civilization, Chinese civilization, the Greek civilization. These are some of the civilizations which we, you know, talk about whenever we talk about doing mathematics. But that's it. We just say uh, that, you know, uh, maths is being developed in, it was developed in Egypt, math was being, you know, developed in Hindi, uh, Indus Valley civilization, zero kaha se aya, zero shunya ka jo concept hai, that was Indian or was it Western. What we feel or what we do not do is we do not connect it to other things or which were happening around them. What led to the discovery of these ideas? What led to the discovery of, let's say, zero, or you know, the idea of talking about zero? Why was zero invented in India? Why? What was the need that us, you know, we had to? We had no choice. We had to come up with this idea of zero. Anybody could have. Why couldn't Egyptians or the Roman system that you talk about? You know, Roman numbers that we write is one, and then we use two. Uh, sticks to do two, and then we write one, two, three, three sticks to do, do three, and then we look at four, which is one, and then V, and five is V, and six is V, and then one. Isn't it strange that, you know, how did they came up with this? How, how did they thought of this idea of, you know, writing these sticks and, you know, uh, subtracting one from minus five to get four, and then you add five V plus one to get five, six, sorry. It's very intriguing. Uh, and why could not they think of zero? So if you add, let's say, you know, now you don't do it, but when we were uh, uh, students in, in, you know, I remember in our textbooks, they, we used to learn all these um, uh, numeral systems, but it just stopped there. We, ne we were never let to add. So I give you an exercise. For example, if I ask you to write 562, I'm randomly saying 562 and add it to 
378 in Roman. So first you'll have to bring this number to the Roman numeral system. Think you are living in Rome and you have to add. So you'll have to first create those symbols and write 562 in Roman symbols. And then you add, I don't know whether you will be using a, 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 a column wise addition or you will be using, you know, a, 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 a horizontal way of writing the numbers and you will be adding. Well, that's up to you how you look at it. There is a lot of things that one can do. But just think about it that they did not, there is no symbol of zero. Roman were never, never talking about zero. We were talking, we had to come up, we had to come up with the place value system. Why? Obviously, there was a need. We were doing a lot of things on the astronomical level. We were doing big, big calculations and we were doing very small calculations with respect to the infinite, the Anu, the concept of atom. So science was helping us, astronomy, the study of astronomy we were doing, we were looking into the, uh, the passage of uh, uh, these uh, planets and stars. We were studying those astronomical spaces. We were studying stars. So we were doing long calculations. We had to. That led to the idea of place value. Hum kar nahi paate agar hamare paas nahi hota. Hum agar Roman system ke hisab se kar rahe hote, to hum add, subtract, multiply nahi kar pa rahe hote. We would not have been able to add, subtract, divide, and do things like that had we not introduced a place value and had there not been a concept of zero or a placeholder, if I may call it. The uh, zero came out as a number in the Indian system because we were doing our rituals, because we were doing um, uh, things which, which were related to big numbers. So maths was not isolated. Even then, we were, we were doing chemicals, we were studying them, we were looking into building of houses. So we had to come up with these ideas. There was no escape to it. You see, so the, it, there was a need, there was an evolution of concept. Please remember, there was an evolution of concept that led to mathematics. It was interlinked. One led to the discovery of other. So if you could do this, you could do then other things. Okay. Let me take this to another concept, which was, if you look at just the Egyptian way, Egyptians are also, you know, we, they were also doing a lot of mathematics, a lot of mathematics from the ground, you know, from, from geometry, they were doing a lot of things, which means study of the earth. Uh, they also, if you just simple example, I will give you, uh, just to tell you, you know, why we need to look at, I'm just, I mean, I'm just laying the foundation of my talk. I've just not even started my talk. I'll just, if you see the middle row on your screen where there are symbols written, you know, there is a symbol for one, there is a symbol for 10, there is a symbol for 100, there is a symbol for 1000. Uh, so their script, the heliographic script was using these symbols to write numbers. How they were writing numbers, there's a different workshop that I can do or any one of you, or you can even Google it and read it from internet. Importantly is, why were they using these symbols? You know, how was language being held? How did you think of this inverted? You know, you're seeing it as inverted N or, or N, sorry, inverted U or N, but that was actually the horseshoe, you know, the, the horseshoe that we use. Hundreds is actually a coil. It's a coil. And thousand is a lotus. And 10,000 is a finger. Let me move to a big number where you see a person standing like this, you know, that was a symbol of a king or a pharaoh. What was happening? They were, they were not using these numbers. For them, there, were, there is a lot of literature which talks about why they were using these symbols for doing it. So, for example, one. Now, one is being, you know, it's just a stick that was universal. Many people were using one as a stick. Horseshoe, which means when you have a cluster of 10, then they replaced it with a horseshoe, which meant that if you're a peasant, you would be needing a group of people. You would have own a horse probably. So if you have 10 servants under you, you probably also have a horse. If you have a horse, then that means you have almost 10 people and working under you. So there was a context which gave birth to this symbol of uh, for 10. A coil was bounding people together in a group. So if you could, if you could manage to have an army of 10 people and pull a thread around that, which means you could rope them around, that means you are, you have something related to 10. 
so a normal farmer or a normal peasant would not need a uh, coil all right he would or she would he actually there was females were not even working so that person would only be you know at most working with a horseshoe so he needed only a horseshoe which symbolized 10 coil would be perhaps like a zamindar or a landlord who would have a people around him and he would need rope to measure his land so they 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 use the rope to uh, indicate 100 uh, let me move ahead then i'm going to go to that last symbol you know i don't have time to go to this history or the conversation of other symbols let's look at the the king a king was the most powerful person and only he would need numbers as big as this uh, nobody else would you know this is like the king of kings only he would be using a big number of 10 raised to power 6 or 10 raised to power 4 so only he was allowed to use this number that is why it had a symbol like this common man they had not were were not needed they didn't need it so it it they since they don't need it 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 never came to them so you see now what i'm trying to tell you is there's again a multidisciplinary perspective here this has drawn from the art of symbolization and semantics the numbers or the number sense or the numerals or the the um the uh, connotation of symbolization drew from there so aaj agar hum one ko aise likhte hain two ko aise likhte hain there are many whatsapp stories which come up you know about angles they're not bullshit they're all rubbish no please go into the history and then you will see why two is being symbolized as this and three is symbolized as this and four is written like this you know very interesting and then go on and forth foremost then you know i was talking to um, uh, dr vinny in the afternoon and she reminded in fact i would take this example i told her that if, unless we understand the evolution of concepts we will not be able to create a a justify space for our students to learn them unless we create a need to learn them we can never do justice to their learning so what led to let's say the idea of integers minus sign for 100 years there was a debate mathematicians could not think of a number like minus 1 they had lot of debate they could not think and you know when we are giving in our examples in the textbooks when you giving examples like you know minus 1 is when you go towards left side the number line it starts from minus 1 minus 2 so on and so forth or the lift going up and down i'm sorry but these examples have actually diluted the whole idea of doing mathematics uh, the int integers never came up like that my the idea of minus 1 if you read history it it wasn't like this there was a need to create it and that need came from an interdisciplinary perspective now i'm not saying multidisciplinary here because the after a while from multidisciplinary to coming to interdisciplinary now what happened was the idea of number of minus 1 uh, emerged when people started doing algebra so when they were doing algebra so uh, you know to find the answer of x minus 1 is equal to 0 what value should you put an unknown number which when subtracted from 1 will nullify the result was easy to do x minus 1 is equal to 0 to x nikalna asaan tha bata sakte the aap x kya tha लेकिन इसी इक्वेशन में अगर मैं चेंज कर दूं और लिख दूं x प्लस वन इज इक्वल टू जीरो इट वॉज क्रेजी फॉर मैथमेटिशियन थिंक एट दैट टाइम ऐसी कौन सी वैल्यू x में वन में डाली जाए जिससे रिजल्ट फिर जीरो हो जाए जिससे दिस इज वे दिस इज एबसर्ड यू आर एंटी थीस्ट यू आर दिस यू आर डैट यू आर आउट कास्टेड एंड ब्ला 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 इट है and gradually it worked out that you know if you have to bring it out if you say what then that was the idea of minus 1 that minus 1 plus 1 is equal to 0 so you add minus 1 to 1 which nullifies and bring it to 0 but yes there were a lot of debates and for many years even mathematicians were not ready to accept it to agar mathematicians nahi accept kar pa rahe the to minus 1 ka concept agar hum class 6 ke bacche ko sikhate hain to kyun dikkat aati hai uske pedagogy mein uske psychology mein there is a reason why children do not understand fractions is because fractions are built up on years of understanding in teachers have built up on years of human uh, uh, struggle with the ideas so anyway so you know there are aspects so what i wanted to tell you till now at uh, that please be open in accepting mathematics as multidisciplinary transdisciplinary but as a discipline itself also 
Okay, let me move it. Any questions till now? I'll be take, I, I'm happy to take or organize, please tell me if I can move on. Ma'am, no questions yet. Okay. And how much time do I have? All right. Okay, so um, there are a few videos that I've been making in this lockdown. I'd like to share a few. This is like a teaser, a commercial break for all of you. If you, you know, you've been hearing from me for quite some time, a short commercial break for all of you. I'm going to show you a video, two minutes video. Let's see if you have this. And then I'll pause this video in between and I'll ask you to answer, all right? So this is something that I'm trying to create. And let's see if you have a mathematical eye. So I'll just start this video. Welcome friends. In this episode of Do You Have a Mathematical Eye? We I'm need to see if you... Uh, we can't yes. see, sorry. We can't see the video. Okay. So you have to stop sharing and share. I have to? Try again. We couldn't see the video. We could hear it. Oh. Okay. Click on it once again. Just see. So do I have to share now the video screen? Yes, yes. Uh, share oh. the video screen. Oh, had I known this? Uh, okay, anyways. Uh, because I'll I toggle. Uh, all right, I'll toggle in between. Oh, this would be a bit of a task. Can you see the screen now? Yes, yes. Eye for chai, can you see that? Yes. All right. So, uh, Vinny ma'am, what I'll do is in between, I'll stop it for the participants to respond. Yeah. But after one minute of this video, this video in any case is one minute, 26 seconds. So I think I'll have to stop after uh, maybe 50 seconds or something. Okay. Welcome friends. In this episode of Do You Have a Mathematical Eye? We're going to see if you have an eye for chai. So if you're a fond tea lover and like to have your tea through tea bags, you would have noticed that there are different shaped tea bags available in the market. There is a pillow shaped tea bag, a pyramid shaped tea bag, a circular shaped tea bag and a stick like tube. And here's the challenge. For the same amount and quality of tea leaves, which of these shaped tea bags will give you a better brew? Do you have a mathematical eye for the shapes? So, um, so what I've asked in this video is among the three shapes, the triangle, pyramid, and the square, which one, which tea bag for the same amount of tea bag and quality, of course, which tea bag will give you a better brew, which will give you a better taste of tea? Okay, so over to the organizers to please give me some responses. Okay, I think we can read out the responses, Rachel. Yes, ma'am. Ma'am, the chat has been, the chat box is flooded with responses, okay. and we have um, maximum responses as a square, followed by pyramid, then triangle pyramid, and the minimum responses are for circular. Okay. Uh, very interesting and I'm so, so very glad that people are listening to the talk so very carefully. Okay, let me share my thoughts on this and I'm switching on the video. Uh, so if you've, uh, you, I'll, you know what you've done? You've actually made a conjecture. All of you have made a conjecture. That's the foremost thing of thinking mathematically. Let your students make conjectures, all right? You've not proved it, you've made a conjecture. Okay, congratulations, everyone. Let me just switch on the video. The quality of tea depends upon proper brewing of the tea leaves and of course the quality of tea leaves. When we add hot water to the tea bag, the tea leaves in it swell, they move in a circular motion and ooze out their flavor. More space will ensure a better brew. The pyramid shape just qualifies to be a better shape and it gives enough space for the ingredients to unwind, infuse, and expand properly, releasing maximum flavor. 
By using the pyramid-shaped tea bag, the manufacturers are actually in a win-win situation. They use less material, they use less amount of tea leaves, but get a better brew. And of course, the shape of the pyramid is so attractive that it can be made expensive. Hope you enjoyed this little maths in your cuppa. Chai time! Okay, so I'll end it here. Welcome friends. In this episode of Do You Have a Mathematical Eye? We're going to see if you have an eye for chai. Okay. So, uh, so what we've done here, I hope you liked it. Uh, I've just tried to explain. Uh, sorry, let me share my. So I'll have to toggle, right, Winnie, ma'am? I think yes. I'll have to. Yes. Stop. Stop. Share first, and then share again. Yeah. All right. I hope I don't do any mistake. No, take your time, ma'am. Just, just stop share. Yeah. There is stop share, no, on top red button. I'm trying, I'm trying, I'm just trying. So stop, yeah, I've stopped sharing. All right, okay, back. So, um, so what we've done, you know, what I'm trying to say is, uh, um, you know, you have tea every day, but which is the most uh, um, economical uh, shape that you would use? And people gave their answers, and then there are, uh, uh, you, I mean, this. I'm, I'm sure this you would have thought, and you would have tried to think, you know, which is a better one. And uh, this is something that you do every day. Every day, you know, people are very fond of shapes. Every day we see shapes around us. What we fail to do is connect it to the mathematical, small little mathematical ideas. You know why, if we're talking about, let's say, we are, if you're te teaching about similarities or we're talking about three dimensional shapes, we teach it in such isolation and don't even think about making it connections to real life. Don't even think about connecting it to um, a problem. So, this had the idea of, uh, you know, when I'm talking about that the that the tea leaves swirl around, they swell and then they swirl around. There is a motion, there is physics attached to it. There is chemical formula which is taking place when the tea leaves get attracted and they hit their warm water. Understand that and then only you will understand why they are swirling around, what happens, you know, understand the kinematics of the liquid and so on and so forth. So you can actually bring up a project on, you know, what happens and then observe it, make a video of it and, you know, there are a lot of things that you can do. Anyways, so let me go ahead with my presentation. This was just one example. Let me uh, go back to my presentation. I, I'm going to share a couple of more examples. Is my screen uh, visible now, the PowerPoint? Yes, yes. Absolutely. Right. So... Yeah. Um, right. So every day you find a lot of connections of mathematics with other subjects. And I was just going through your earlier talks and I, I, I came across the web series uh, sixth episode in which uh, Dr. Jeshri Subramaniam had spoken about mathematics that happens every day. She talked about ethnomathematics, where she brought a point on how mathematics is connected to culture. Those also give us very beautiful examples of Connecting mathematics, you know, uh, to our different cultures. I'm sure she gave you an example of mathematics that happened in a pawn shop. Uh, you know, there are a lot of things that a person is selling. There are a lot of uh, negotiations that are happening on the commercial sense. How this child thinks about the profit. If there is a man or, or you know, a person who's sitting at the pawn shop, how she or he negotiates between the different articles which are kept in that shop, even then she or he knows how to bring out a profit. So that's an idea of uh, mathematics which is happening every day. Um, you know, something that I do with my students is we take them for a walk to the uh, to this uh, market of um, potters and uh, I ask them to look at how these potters, how beautifully the potters will just take a blob of uh, mitti and, you know, with this circular thing which is going on and on on this disc which is rotating so fast they bring up a shape which is so symmetrical in shape but don't stop there what happens is ki hum itna sa dekh kar ki are maths bahut achha symmetry ho raha hai is article mein symmetry batao and we just stop there don't do that if you have to bring out mathematics to its true sense 
please go beyond it let children come back and then give them the shape so you know ask them ki agar mere paas ek uh, square hai and if uh, let me see okay i'm sorry i was not prepared but since you know as a teacher you evolve your teaching also suppose this is a sheet of paper and i have a a, a, a thin wire which is going around on here and on this thin wire i can put a, a, a an electronic thing which can circulate it i've done this with my class with my ba students so agar is wire pe if i rotate this like this you know on this wire what shape would you get i'm sure this is a very simple answer everybody knows it gets a, it gets a cylinder now if the wire is placed here again i'm going to rotate it on this wire you know so this is here and i'm going to do what you look at you will again get a cylinder that's fine but of these two cylinders which will have a bet which will have more volume or which on these will have a more um, uh, 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 surface area talk about that okay now let me go beyond it what if i put the wire from here diagonally and i rotate it like this what shape would you get this is extremely interesting and if you can you know so if i do this in in with lot of so suppose i have a disc like this with the potter's use and on that potter's uh, disc i place this little sheet of paper with a string of uh, you know a string going diagonally from here and i rotate it with lot of speed i mean i i can't do it through my hand but imagine it is like circulating what three dimensional shape would you get do you have a name or just imagine just close your eyes and imagine that from a paper diagonally attached if you are rotating it what shape would you get so that's how shape shapes came up three dimensional shapes came up through this axis of rotation and then you know suppose there is it's not a plane i'm not doing it from here i just pierce it through through the center and i rotate it like this what would you get and why so you start moving from one dimension to two dimension through three dimension and i do this with various shapes abhi square utha ke dekhte hain abhi rectangle utha kar dekhte hain abhi isko hum uh, ek trapezium utha kar dekhte hain aur uske different side se usko rotate karke dekhte hain sometimes you will not even have the name for the shape because it's not there in the textbook but students can describe you that shape they can tell you for example this rectangular thing or if i ask you on on a rectangle this piercing from the center and rotating it like this give me the answer think about it i'll tell you the common answer that will be we don't have time because i have to move ahead common answers that would come up is a square or a disk or a circle sorry or a disk but that's not the correct answer so if you were planning to give disk or a circle uh, that's not the correct answer so do it and then post your answers anyway so you pick up from what the cobbler uh, from the potter's market and you delve into the uh, mainstream mathematics and you start talking about how mathematics is uh, you know these shapes are involved and uh, carpentry a uh, lot of examples these are some examples and i'm sure dr jayshree mathur had shared many things which happened in ethro mathematical way i've been uh, i also saw that you she talked about columns and you know the way females make integrated designs by just using those uh, rice atta and they make you know go on and on and on uh, those are actually euler's graphs basically you know so this is uh, and i remember when i was a child my grandfather used to give me a lot of examples he used to say che ye banao bina haath uthaye aur bina ek line ke upar dusre those were games for us but they was they were integrated euler's graphs columns have that you know that kind of a mathematical inbuilt in it so you take mathematics from there anyways i'm not going to go into, into ethno mathematics because uh, uh, you can watch jayshree's uh, uh, video for that and this is what i plan to do that if you look look at columns they they look like this and then you go on and on and you make such integrated designs which are actually euler's graphs i'm skipping this because jayshree already done it however coming back to the multidisciplinary perspective i cannot you know go i mean i i can go here and there but i have to come back to my multidisciplinary why did i pick ethno mathematics also in my multidisciplinary because mathematics also has a social contextual flavor in it there was a reason why our cultures or there were reason why we were doing uh, uh, columns so please understand you know let your children take up a project on not just looking mathematics in the column designs 
but also looking at what it meant, what it means to make a kolam. Why do they thought of, why are these shapes used as kolams? What was the cultural background? Why is it like this? Or even, you know, in Northern India, we make rangolis before Diwali. Obviously there is a tradition of decorating our house, but it's not just that. This ritual was not only just to, you know, make a good design and decorate your house. Kolams, when they were making a, a, a single stream without picking up their hands and they, they're making such beautiful designs, why? Why, who taught them, who taught these ladies and their ladies were, you know, taught by their grandmothers and then grandmothers would have been taught by their grandmothers. I'm sure there is a cultural connection. And if you understand that cultural connection, you would understand why they were making these designs and what it meant for them. That is the perspective that we need to bring up. That it is not just related only to science, but also to aestheticness. When I say maths is an, it is an art and mathematics is also an art. So you need to not choose to do mathematics in terms of Euler's graph. Euler took it up. I mean, Euler was not doing columns, of course. So Euler did only graph theory. But uh, our females may, are making only art. They, they don't know Euler's uh, graph theory. And Euler did not know column. Let's manage them. Let's create, a, let's create a connection between them. As teachers, we need to make a connection. We know what is there in the disciplinary mathematics. We know what is happening in our context. We know what is happening with, with our students. We know from the background that they're coming from. We can connect it. So if you have potters, uh, a, a village near your uh, school, or there are a lot of students who are coming from that background, please merge it. Please take it ahead and do it. That's what multidisciplinary approach is about. Please take it together and take the benefits of each field and go ahead and charge, you know, just barge, just go. Uh, so, okay. Are you ready for another episode, a teaser? Uh, can I uh, start another? So this is mathematics and biology, which is another one of my videos. So let's take a commercial break and see if we have a mathematical mind and can we connect maths and bio also. So can I do this? I think we'll have to stop sharing and then again go back. Right, Dr. Vini? Yes, yes. Oh, sorry for this talking. I think I don't have a choice, so. You can right. click on that uh, channel. Yes, I'm doing that. And once it's on, I'll. Today we're going to talk about patterns on animal okay. skin. So I'll share the screen. Can you see the screen? Yes, yes. Okay, great. Here's it. Hello friends. Today we are going to talk about patterns on animal skin. Animals have varied skin textures and patterns. If I ask you to name an animal which has spots on its skin, probably you will tell me a leopard. And if I ask you to name an animal which has a striped body, I think a zebra would come to your mind instantly. Let's come to the interesting part of it. What about their tails? Is the tail of a leopard spotted or striped? Is the tail of a zebra striped or spotted? Do you know of an animal which has a striped body but a spotted tail? Do you have a mathematical eye? Okay. So I've asked you a small question about the tails of animals. You know that there are uh, spotted animals like um, a leopard, which has a spotted body and a striped tail. Do you know of any animal which has a striped body and a spotted tail? I think I'll go ahead because that's it's not a very simple one. Uh, are there any responses or shall I go ahead? Ma'am, no responses. The participants are thinking. There won't be because there isn't any animal like that. <laughs> All right. So uh, let me tell you why. So the answer is not why we... Sorry? Ma'am, there's one response. Hmm. It's, uh, it's Dalmatian dog. Dalmatian dog. Dalmatians. Uh, no, it also has a spot. No, please. Uh, so I, I'll switch on the video. And this has got again to the, uh, let me just give you a prelude to it. 
again i'm going to talk about volumizing and spacing of molecular uh, structures all well, that's the theory behind it but let me do it in a very very um, softer way not too much of mathematics so here's the answer well it's quite possible of an animal to have a spotted body and a striped tail but it's not likely to have an animal which has a striped body but a spotted tail and mathematically one can explain this the person who gave logic to computers also gave a differential equation in which by changing the parameters one can explain this conjecture the man is alan turing in simple terms alan turing's theory of morphogenesis goes something like this two chemicals let's call it a reagent and a diffuser interact to influence skin patterns if the reagent stimulates the production of one color the diffuser suppresses it there is also a relationship between the shape and size of the skin area on which this reaction occurs squarish regions of roughly the same overall area give rise to spots long thin regions lead to stripes perpendicular to the length of the region this reaction diffusion process takes place at the development of the embryo since the embryo of a zebra is thin pencil like it leads to stripes whereas leopard's embryo is fairly chubby and therefore gives spots its tail however is thin and pencil like so the resulting pattern is stripes this is how nature can be explained through mathematics love nature love maths okay so hello friends Sorry. today we are going to talk about patterns on animal skin animals have varied skin texture yeah. so i stop sharing and yes so this was again understanding nature and there are a lot of things you know this is one example of animal's body you can even look at there are a lot of things you need i mean people who are in maths know about fractals and there is self similarity then there are also examples of uh, fibonacci series in uh, in nature but what we do not do you know when we are talking about fractals we say that you know maths to matlab nature ke andar hai or maths is so divine we need to understand why there is spiraling in the in the in the in the fibonacci you know we say fractals mein hai or self similarity lekin wo self similarity leaves mein bani kyun hai us aspect ko samajhiye aur us aspect ko samajhne के लिए आपको बायोलॉजी भी देखनी पड़ेगी आपको मोशन ऑफ सन भी देखना पड़ेगा लीव्स का स्ट्रक्चर देखना पड़ेगा ज्योग्राफी पढ़नी पड़ेगी डेमोग्राफिक उसको समझना पड़ेगा कि क्यों पाइंस की शेप इस तरह की होती है कि वो स्पाइरल रिंग बन रहे होते हैं एंड लीव्स आर यू नो लाइक थिन लाइक इन सम डेमोग्राफिकल एरिया और दे ब्रॉड एंड देन वाई दे आर ब्रॉड एंड देन वॉट हैपन्स सो द स्पेस वॉल्यूमाइजिंग द शेप along with all these things will bring out the flavor of any subject any discipline so you know it's not just looking maths maths biology biology please look at how uh, they come out as in a multidisciplinary aspect aspect so uh, can i move ahead with to my presentation back to my presentation yes please. any questions or would you like me to take a few questions in between or shall i shall i go ahead Ma'am, currently the chat box is flooded with appreciation post from the participants, so there are no questions yet. So, ma'am, you can. I think yes. So, please make some notes. I'll be very happy to take your observations. And thank you so much for your appreciations. Uh, uh, okay. So, let me go ahead. All right. Now, another aspect that you know many. teachers and many students ask us about integrating art in fact actually cbse ne shayad abhi 11 12 mein kuch bhej diya uh, because of you know uh, online classes i because you know i see what lots of whatsapp uh, chats being flooded with maths or art ka connection kya hai uh, to connection hai lekin connection ko hum sirf uh, art aur maths pe na chode uske andar ja kar bhi dhoonde ki kya connection aata hai and the beautiful example which i come across is regarding tessellations i 
you know, there are two, three articles which I've published related to tessellations. I don't have time to go into that, but in, I'm just going to a glimpse. I'm just going to like, you know, uh, till now you've understood my pedagogy of this webinar. I am, you know, hitting and moving on, hitting and moving on. Or why maybe here bhi karne wali tessellations, baby. Tessellations are small motives. In simple terms, it's called tiling, which you use it in your bathrooms and everywhere. So there is a small motive and that motive gets uh, multiplied on the plane. Now it's on a plane, all right? I'm not talking about a three-dimensional space. motive jisko aap infinitely repeat aur usme koi gap na ho. Ye jo figures aapko hai, ye sare humne, sare nahi, except the left hand side, they are from uh, some other temple. I'll tell you the name of the temple because that's full of uh, these tessellating tiling. But apart from these two on the left hand side, the others that you've seen are were taken pics which were taken in and around Delhi. This includes Vice Regal Lodge of Delhi University. This includes Chandni Chowk. This includes um, a Red Fort, and this also includes Bangla Sahib. And the small picture where you're seeing those feet, though feet are in me, wo metro line ke tiling patterns. Hai. Metro, jo, Delhi metro, mein jate, wahan ka jo pavement hai, uske tiling patterns. Hai. So you see these, there is a small motive which is repeatedly uh, iterating itself infinitely on a plane. This is where, you know, many people stop that it has similarity. It has symmetry. And many teachers it take examples that, you know, you look at transitivity symmetry, you look at um, rotational symmetry, you look at glide symmetry in these tessellations. But that's not the pleasure of doing it. The fun of doing it ki Glide symmetry kyu hai? Rotational symmetry kyu hai? Kaun si aisi shape thi jo rotational symmetry bani? Wo sochye. To sirf sochne ka nazariya badalna hai. Ki kya shape thi ki ye glide symmetry mein aagya? Kya shape thi ki us tessellation mein rotational tha? So if you do a little bit of reading on how this, this beautiful art is connected to a mathematical thinking, you will talk about shapes. You will talk about, you know, there are three shapes that tessellate in itself, which are triangles, squares, and hexagons. I'm talking about regular shapes. Abhi ye regular shape pe jayenge, to bhoat lambi story chali jayegi. Main sirf regular shapes vei le rahi There are three regular shapes, a regular triangle, a regular square, and a regular hexagon, which tessellate in itself. Why they do it is also a bit of small little primary mathematics, really primary mathematics. Angle some property padna hai, aur kuch nahi padna hai. Um, uh, there are many articles that you can read or I'll post you, give you my articles, which I've explained in a couple of magazines, mathematical magazines. And some shapes do not tessellate, like a regular pentagon will not tessellate, a regular octagon will not tessellate. So overall, we know that there are only three. By some very small preliminary primary mathematics, I can prove or I can tell you that only these three shapes tessellate in itself, a square, a regular hexagon with itself and a regular uh, uh, triangle with itself. Now, if you look at these shapes, they also have a symmetry in itself. So a square has a rotational symmetry of order four, a square has a transitivity symmetry, and so on and so forth. So if you go on tessellating a square tile, you are bound to see rotational symmetry and you're bound to see a translation symmetry. However, if you look at hexagon, only the tessellation of hexagon, it only works in terms of a rotational symmetry of order six. And triangles also have a rotational symmetry of order three. So if you're looking at that, and if you look at, uh, if I do some bit of tweaking in these parent tiles, inko thoda sa mein, iska thoda sa piece nikal do, or kahi or laga do, or phir usko kuch kuch karu, to in se jo modified tiles hongi, wo bhi tessellate karti hai. And uh, I can, you know, it's it's small thing, but I don't have time. I will not go into that. But if we tweak it a little bit, then it will make beautiful tiling beautiful tiling patterns, which I showed you in the starting. If you look at the bottom, which is uh, green and yellow and red and white tiles, the glazy ones, hai, they are actually unmodified from uh, triangles. So if you take a triangle and you nibble out some piece and you stick it somewhere else, and then you say, so if you see the center point, it has a rotational symmetry similar to the triangles. But if you see the tiling pattern of, let's say, where the, where the legs are, where you can see the feet, that has a rotational symmetry similar to the rotational symmetry of a regular hexagon. 
So one can make, or you can make a conjecture that this has probably been made from regular hexagon, and which is true also, actually, by the way. Anyways, so yeah, you know, so if you study the properties of the shape, then you can understand the properties of the tessellations. And now, if you can join other shapes, then you get other beautiful patterns like this. Now, this is work of my students that I'm showing you that we created more shapes. Now, if we shapes ko thoda sa unke beech mein joining shuru kar de, then we get tessellations like this. And then we started drawing and then we started erasing some part and adding some part. So the, the last two pieces that you see on your right are basically on the tessellation pattern. We are talking about circles. If I made the largest circle within a within a shape and I erase the shapes, then the right extreme right hand side is actually a tessellation of circles. And I'm going to talk about maximizing the space, you know, between uh, these circles and jahan se wo bane hai. So wo jo aapka, agar aapko sirf right side wala jali ka pattern kisi ghar mein dikhega, to wo bhi isi sab shape se aya hai. So all in all that I want to tell you is this connection of art Again, a multidisciplinary perspective, but building up on the realms of a disciplinary approach of doing mathematics. It cannot be divorced from that. You have to bring up first the study of shapes, then you connecting, and then you bring up these patterns, and then you go back to it. Ye kaise aaya? Isme shape kaun si hogi? Iski maximization kaise hogi? Aur phir wo hum uh, daily use mein use karte hain. Agar aapne dekha hogi, if you're living in northern belt of India, you know, in this season, particularly in, in January and February, in these winters, we get a lot of cauliflowers. And people who are from Northern Belt would know that, you know, when, you, when the cauliflowers are transported from one place to another, they are stacked. And you don't wind them, you know, there's no dhaga ya koi rassi se banda nahi hota. They are so closely packed that they do not move. They do not fall apart. And they're transported like that. Which means that the shape of the cauliflower is so very... Um, you know, they're fitted so well that you don't fall. Uh, it, it, it's not, it's, they're not joined. They're not joined by any rusty. Like, with me, achhi se fitted hote hai, the fitting is so strong that they don't fall off. Similarly, uh, spheres, when you put them, you know, juice nikal ne, juice shops, aapne dekha hoga ki wo oranges, they are stacked. And they're still stacked so beautifully that they don't fall off. What is being done? You know, understand. Aisa kya ho rahe? Kaun si aisi shape se wo, uh, uh, kaun si aisi binding wo hai jis se wo uh, kar rahe hai? Aur wo fir aapko study of crystals pe leke jata hai. Jab aap crystallography padhte hai, chemistry ke students padhte hai, to wo yehi se aata hai. Tessellation ke idea ko jab hum three dimension me leke jata hai, jab hum stacking of shape ki baat karte hai, tab aapko crystal samal maata hai. And if you understand the shape of the crystals and then you understand how they have been stacked and what makes a strong crystal. So you, you know, then that field gets opened. So this is a small background to, to chemistry, to art and going up and down from math, taking from art, going it, bring it, bringing to the mathematics, taking it from mathematics, bring, throwing it back. Okay. okay, let's do one more. Shall we do one more commercial break? So I think I can skip this. I'll skip this. I'm so I'll go to the next one. This is an interesting one. Yeah. Uh, you can watch. Sorry. No, no, ma'am. I said this is interesting because I've, I've also seen it. <laughs> okay. So uh, another uh, teaser uh, on mathematics and shoelacing. This is also one of uh, the tales one. And this is one of my favorites as well. Because while making these, I learned a lot of things. So let me just open this. Okay, you have to stop sharing. Stop and push the lace in a crisscross manner. The zigzag end pattern. One end runs from bottom to top, while the other end zigzags through the remaining eyelet. Okay. So let me start it from the beginning. Is it visible? Is this visible? The the video is yes, visible. Yes. Can you see the shoes hanging? Yes, yes. Yes, ma'am. Okay. Okay. So here it goes. Today we are going to do some street maths. But first, let me tie my shoelaces. I just realized 
that the shoelace style in both my shoes is very different. In one, there is a N zigzag pattern, while in the other, there is a crisscross pattern. And so I wonder, do mathematics have a role to play in shoelacing as well? In how many types can you lace your shoe? And which of these will give you a better fit? Which is more comfortable? Do you have a mathematical eye? Okay, so the question is, I'm sure this is not easy. You cannot give an answer right now. How many ways can you, uh, how many patterns can you create on your shoes? That's the first question. So you're talking about combinatorics. Also, you know, the most, uh, in fact, it's is zyada jo zaruri hai, itne patterns jo banayenge, unme se sabse badiya fit kaun sa dega aapko? Kaun sa aise jis aapka shoe jo hai, uh, you know, it will give you a comfortable fit. Is there a connection? Okay, so I think I cannot uh, leave it that open for the people to answer uh, because to calculate the number of uh, uh, styles is also needs a bit of thinking. Uh, I think I'll move on. I'll, I'll continue with the video. Bukhart Polster, a mathematician, has actually written a book on shoelacing in which he is given a wide variety of shoelacing styles. Let's discuss some of these in this video. I'm going to discuss three most common styles which are used for lacing the shoes. Firstly, the crisscross lacing. The most widely used style of lacing is the crisscross style. We start from the top and push the lace in a crisscross manner. The zigzag end pattern. One end runs from bottom to top while the other end zigzags through the remaining eyelets. This style comes as a factory setting, therefore it is seen in most of the shoe shops. This style was also commonly used in some military regiments long time back. Because if your foot gets injured, you can just swipe it off. Straight European lacing. In this style, the laces run straight across on the outside and diagonally on the inside. Although this is a visually messy style, but the zigzag on the underline makes it a very comfortable and holds the foot together, whereas the upper lining gives it a very neater look. You will be interested to know that if your boot has six pairs of eyelids, you can actually tie them in 43,200 different styles. How many of these have you tried till now? Go on. One, two, lace your shoe. Okay, so before it starts again, I need to close it. Right. So uh, this was about uh, shoelacing. Uh, there is also a very interesting way of tying your uh, ties, you know, knotting your ties. There are many ways in which you can, you know, knot your tie and bring up and down. So this was, it also has, again, as, as we were discussing about the, um, I was discussing about the cultural mathematics and I discussed, you know, in the, in the military stride, if you look at, they had a particular way of tying the shoelaces because if your foot gets hurt, then, you know, with just a swipe of the lace, it can entangle itself and your foot can be set free. So there is a there, there is a story behind it behind shoelacing also that and the factory setting because you know they have to in the in the in the shops they have to keep on letting people try and untie so they use a, a different kind of a styling to uh, to lace the shoe so that's very interesting that you know uh, there is a need there was a process there is a need to use it and when you are doing it something a formal then on a formal uh, suit wear which is of course quite British and quite European then you had a very formal way of uh, tying your shoes because it looks neat on the top and the messiness remains underneath the shoelacing style so um, and you can bring out various ways on which this is done um, any questions or shall I move ahead you can go back no, no questions I think yeah I, I'll we have time to take questions. Uh, what is the time? 5.20. Okay. Uh, this is till 6 o'clock. Right. So I'll take 15, 20 more minutes to finish my presentation. I'm sure there'll be a lot of questions people would have asked. Please note down your questions and your observations. I'd be very happy to take them. Okay. 
Okay, now an important part about politics of mathematics. Uh, whose mathematics is it anyway? Is it my mathematics? Is it Greek mathematics? Or these ethnographic mathematic mathematicians that we talk about, can we take their mathematics also? So uh, I'm going to tell you a small short anecdote, which will help you to connect that, you know, what kind, this is also for mathematics teachers. How can we question the mathematics in itself? So let me take an example of a mason. You know, when you build your house, so what you are doing in your house, अगर आपने घर कभी बनवाया है तो आपने देखा होगा कि वो घर में काम कैसे करते हैं अगर उनको कमरा बनाना है your rooms are basically rectangles right squares or rectangles and how do you see you know in school when we are taught about making a rectangle the definition of a rectangle is derived from the idea of parallelogram which means you should have the idea of parallel lines first then you talk about the distance between two parallel lines and that's how you build up your idea of rectangle which means the idea of parallelism is important to understand the definition of a rectangle agar aise hota to hamare jo masons the jab wo ghar banate to wo do parallel lines pehle banate ye parallel line banate wo parallel line banate aur fir wo kehte are ji rectangle ban gaya lekin aisa hota nahi hai मतलब उनकी जो बेसिक डेफिनेशन है वो पैरल लाइन से नहीं आई है आपने अगर उनको देखा तो वो क्या करते हैं दे टेक टू थ्रेड्स और टू सूतलीस दे टाई इट अप फ्रॉम द मिडल एंड देन दे स्ट्रेच देम दे स्टाउट देम ऑल राइट दे स्ट्रेटन अप देम एंड व्हेन दे गेट टाउट देन दे मार्क देयर पॉइंट्स राइट सो इट कम्स लाइक दिस सो दीज सूतलीस व्हिच आर टाइड अप इन अ क्रॉस क्रॉस वे gets stout and then they mark these four points and that's how they start thinking about this as a rectangular plot the question that i throw you here is their basic understanding of rectangle is not coming from the basic understanding of what we have learnt in terms of parallelism their basic understanding or so called like i can call a definition of triangle has come from the idea of diagonals so rectangle for them is a closed figure in which the diagonals are uh, uh, equidistant in which the length of the or the midpoint of the diagonals you know is 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 equal and then you make a rectangle so this is for them the definition will come from here and for us the definition comes from the parallelism so an important point to think about here is can we change it if we have to take up a, a perspective which is broader multidisciplinary then we have to open our eyes to looking things in a multi perspective way as well which means we'll have to look into the definitions and underlying assumptions and see it from someone else's eye also or the historical eye also or the other eye as well ki hamesha hum parallelism se hi rectangle ki padhate hain agar diagonal se padhai to kya mazedar hoga और होता भी बहुत मजेदार है मैं अपनी क्लास में यूक्लिडियन ज्योमेट्री नहीं पढ़ाती मतलब मेरी क्लास अंदर से आई टीच पीएच सबसे अच्छी जो थी ना मतलब अपना पापा तुम दोस्त से समझ लो पापा ने एक्सप्लेन किया मुझे बस टोटल पता था पापा ने तुमने पापा से सब पूछा तो होगा एनी क्वेश्चन इज इट नो मैम सम पार्टिसिपेंट हैड पुट देयर माइक ऑन आई थॉट सेड समबडी हु वांट्स टू से समथिंग हियर ओके सो अम we have yeah so i was talking about that we need to think from that so i was saying that when i deal with my students in my bh students i don't teach them euclidean geometry mai unko non euclidean geometry se shuru karte hu ki chalo non euclidean ek sphere lete hain ek football le kar aao class ke andar ya basketball le ke aao chalo class ke andar basketball le ke aaiye us pe na teen points banaiye theek hai aapne teen points banaye ab us basketball ke aaj aapne three points banaye unko aap join kariye join kiya to ek aapki wo bulge out wala ek triangle banta hai right aise swollen triangle banta hai फिर मन से पूछते हैं आप बताओ कि इसको हम ट्रायंगल कहेंगे कि नहीं कहेंगे जो मतलब बॉल थी जो हमारे पास स्फीयर था उसके ऊपर हमने तीन पॉइंट्स बनाए और तीन पॉइंट्स को ज्वाइन किया एक ट्रायंगल जैसी शेप बन गई अब बताइए कि इसको ट्रायंगल कहेंगे कि नहीं कहेंगे दैट्स अ सिंपल क्वेश्चन दैट आई आस्क देयर आर यस नो मे बी देन आई आस्क देम कि अच्छा ट्रायंगल की डेफिनेशन ढूंढ के आओ क्या है सो देन वी ट्राई टू गेट यू नो सेवरल डेफिनेशंस ऑफ अ ट्रायंगल व्हाट अ ट्रायंगल इज देन वी सी इफ इट दिस what we have done on the sphere does it hold to this triangle definition or not 
So the definition of the most simple definition of triangle is that it is a closed figure which is made by three non-collinear points. So non-collinear points are here too. And we joined it. So now we don't say why we don't say it. Then there is yes, no, debate. There are confusions. So on and so forth. So you know, I love my classes when students come up with these uh, yes, no, maybe. I mean, it could be like this. Its sum of angle of triangles, which is 180, doesn't come. So I said, "It's not a definition. It's not a definition. You don't talk about the sum of angles. It's not a definition. Basic observation or yeah, basic definition. It's not a definition. If it is joining, if it is matching correspondingly one-to-one to -one, so that definition, can we call this figure a triangle? Well, let's discuss that. And it brings out beautiful, uh, you know. conversations and debates so they try to understand that how uh, the concept of triangle is what is what is it what is a quadrilateral what would happen if i make a quadrilateral on a sphere just imagine okay matlab yahi to mathematician ne kiya tha imagine karo ye nahi to wo wo nahi to ye ye change kar diya to kaise ho gaya ab ye surface nahi hai koi aur surface le lete hain ek concave surface le lete hain कॉन्केव सर्फिस होगा तो ट्राइंगल कैसा बनेगा क्वारिलेटर कैसा बनेगा होगा भी कि नहीं होगा पहले तो ये सवाल है सो सो वी टेक शेप्स एंड वी टॉक अबाउट वी ब्रिंग आउट मैथमेटिक्स फ्रॉम देयर ओके लास्ट ऑन माय टीजर एंड देन आई एम गोइंग टू गो टू पार्ट टू व्हिच विल आई टेक 15 20 मिनट्स टू सम अप दीस बेसिक लाइक आई टोल्ड यू आई एम गोइंग टू शेयर अ बुफे ऑफ आइडियाज this is one another idea and i think this would be the last one last video of mine and then i'm going to discuss about pedagogy that needs to be adopted for a for imbibing multidisciplinary approach so just give me a minute i'll share uh mathematics in kitchen is very famous and we all know that you know a lot of schools do and here's the second cake to mathematics is kitchen is very famous we know uh, you know how we talk about proportions we make various recipes and use lot of but this is something different this is also related to shapes it's something different to do with um with the proportional aspect of mathematics let's see how you cut a cake so that's the idea cutting a cake mathematically cutting the cake who doesn't like to have cakes but what if i tell you that cutting the cake also involves some mathematical skills there are good ways of cutting a cake and there are not so good ways of cutting the cake the traditional way or the classical way of cutting the cake is by doing a wedge or making out a sector so when you cut the cake usually you put your knife in the center and you take out a wedge from it like this taking out the wedge or a sector like this this part then gets exposed to the air and loses its moisture can you think of another way of cutting the cake a way in which there is minimum exposure of the surface so that the cake doesn't get dry Can you think of a mathematical way to cut the cake? While you think of so, I'll go and bake another one for you. And here's the second cake to demonstrate the second method. A British mathematician, Galton, said in the famous magazine Nature that to his amusement and satisfaction, the ordinary method of cutting out a wedge is very faulty. He proposed another way to cut the pieces so that the remaining pieces can be co-joined to give least exposure and this was his method. So here's my cake and I'm going to slice it from one cord parallel to it I slice it again. You take out the slice and eat the cake. The remaining part can be joined so that there is least exposure. Now when you join this you can keep it together or put a rubber band around it so that it doesn't get exposed. Next time when you have to cut the cake again put another slice here the next one parallel to this. My cake is a bit crusty so it's crumbling. And you have this pieces go join the remaining part you would see that there is least exposure to the surface and it remains perfectly moisture. Well whatever the procedure be 
Cutting the cake has to be a cakewalk and I'm going to enjoy it. Okay, so that was uh, uh, my last one. So, let me just close the other things which are open. So this was again a scientific process so that you don't lose the moisture in the uh, um, in the cake and it doesn't get dry. Uh, I, I don't know if anyone of you have ever come across this idea earlier or not, but um, uh, now it, everybody at my home only, we, we usually wear on the birthdays when we cut the cake or when we have to store it, we try not to cake, cut a wedge and we store it like that. So uh, this is just, uh, you know, just for fun actually. Okay, so let me go back now. So we've understood uh, how maths is so many things, you know, it's related to, to art, to, uh, I think I've shown you things on sports, on art, on even science, or even mathematics, like the shapes itself, uh, and why we need to take a multidisciplinary uh, perspective. So what can we conclude? Uh, for multidisciplinary, it has to be a mindset. There is nothing called, this is math multidisciplinary mathematics. It's the way as teachers, we take things in our classroom. It's up to us how we create connections. So it is connecting the multiple aspects of mathematics to the classical or the formal knowledge of mathematics so that the subject no longer remains to be an uncharted territory. If you understand, I mean, this is my own words. <laughs> if you understand, uh, this is Gandhism, by the way. Sorry. Sorry for this little pun. This is, I just want to say that, you know, if you are have an open mindset of connecting things, then all subjects are connected. Why even mathematics, you know, science, arts, every subject is so well connected that one doesn't have to take only maths from a multidisciplinary. I think when you're talking multidisciplinary, it means multidisciplinary, which means you take things, some in some aspects, one discipline will dominate on the other and another uh, uh, thing, the other, another episode, another thing will dominate. But if you're talking about in terms of mathematics per se, then your thought or as a teacher, your thought should be to connect mathematics more and print out examples. Like for example, the examples that I've made, irrespective of whether it was cutting a cake or going to, uh, or thinking about animal tales or whatever, the I have looked at it from a mathematical perspective, mathematical eye. So bring, bring out the mathematics from that and bring situations for the students so that they can understand, they can relish, they can enjoy mathematics. Several times, you know, as maths teachers and often we get this question, uh, you know, why are we studying this? How is maths related to real life? I think that's, I, I'm not satisfied. I'm not happy with this question. You study a discipline or a subject because it gives you thrill. I do not have to come to that stage of giving an answer to this question. I'm doing mathematics because I enjoy it. I don't have to find its application on whatever I do. The application may, may not come. But as teachers, you need to think about where maxim where you can you know maximize this these opportunities for students. So this part two, where there's only two three slides, is just kind of summation of the pedagogy. Uh, in simple terms, the pedagogical aspects that you should look out while doing mathematics is that you need to keep in mind the context, context of your learners. You are the best judge to understand the background of the learners in terms of their social background, economical background, or even mathematical background. So you, you can have, there is no, there is, you know, it's like now we know from online classes, we know everything is so convenient. We've got an access to so many things. There's so many YouTube people. There are so many videos. It's just how you take these opportunities and understand what goes well for your students. So it's, a, it's only a teacher who can make, understand the context of the students and then connect ideas from there. It, you have to understand that it is also, your pedagogy is also age and grade dependent. 
all these examples that I've done, I can do it with class three. I can do it with a not, I mean, I created these videos for general public, all right? But I know that when I'm talking about differential equations and if I have to take this example to my graduate students, I, I have the avenue of doing it. There is a scope. Similarly, for, uh, for biomedical students, I, we can do it even for them. So the pedagogy has to be such, you're the best person to understand and grade your pedagogy in terms of the level of your students. So or tessellations, for example, I know people do it with class three, four students. They give them uh, small projects on doing tessellations to even high school mathematics. I can do it even with high school tessellations. And it has to be great, uh, content dependent. Uh, so keep in mind what content, doing, let's say Pythagoras, then we can talk about the cloud or number system, then why don't you pick various kind of number systems from the historical perspective? If you're doing, let's say, uh, let's say something based on linear curve, uh, linear graphs, then pick up examples from optimization, thoughts from optimization. Create your uh, questions around that. Create your create your uh, pedagogy around that. So this is these are the things that you need to keep in mind. Textbooks. So, uh, however, will not give you clear cut answers. You know, there is a there is a limitation to the textbooks. Textbooks cannot give you all these. This is on the teacher. This is the pedagogy of the teacher. To connect the textbook with the learner is the role of a teacher. And finally, what can you do uh, to have multidisciplinary approach in your classroom? So these are some of the examples. You may call it projects. For example, you pick and give projects to, to your students. You can even talk about thematic learning. By the way, on thematic learning, I would like to share these two examples, which I've quoted here, project on functioning of railways and water harvesting. These are two thematically learning projects that we had actually done with our students. Because before doing it with, uh, with, uh, with school children, we thought, let's do it with our own BH students. So a couple of uh, my colleagues and, uh, you know, we, we got together and we started looking at, you know, so they, uh, we had a language person with us. We had a social science person, all our teacher educators. These were all teacher educators. We sat down and we identified certain themes in which we can bring it up in a multidisciplinary perspective. So there was language in it. These are two examples that we could, you know, work on. And then we tried, tried to create some booklets on, we even moved to the level of assessment. So the project on railways was really good. I mean, it was so beautiful. If students had to make um, awareness based posters in it, so it worked the idea of language in it. Then they had to study the nitty gritty of the railways. They had to understand the combinatorics. Then they had to make announcements. So they were talking about language. They had to look into the upstream and the down. So they are looking at the geographical aspects of railways as well. Then they were making timetables. And, you know, so we asked them, OK, let's let's do let's see if, you know, we are given a project on to work, do something for the railways. What are all the things that we do? So this came out as a thematic learning project and it came out very beautifully. I know some of the schools who follow this approach, some of these so-called innovative schools who follow this thematic learning approach and some of the people who do homeschooling primarily follow thematic learning approach. The third is a research-based approach where you pick up examples or real life context and you start talking about them. You research, which means maybe you're not coming up with something something new, but you may only be, you know, talking about something which already exists. You, but you take it in a research manner, you experiment, you make hypothesis, you make a conjecture, then you talk about it, then you build it up like a, uh, like a research uh, idea, and you take it ahead. Uh, more on these ideas are, you know, they're available everywhere. I don't think uh, we can, you know, I think, uh, Xavier's Institute would definitely think about having uh, more sessions or dealing only with these that what do you mean by a research based pedagogy, what would be a thematic based pedagogy or a project based pedagogy. Uh, these are different styles or different ways of looking at pedagogy but worth discussing and some of the ways in which you can take multidisciplinary approach ahead. So, finally, my last slide. I think I'm on time. So finally, 
I conclude that your students should be given an apprenticeship of thinking mathematics, which means if you understand what you mean by apprenticeship is you start thinking, you bringing up, you, you work in that area and you, you are kind of, you know, it's like hands-on uh, process which goes on and on. So to do mathematics, you have to not treat them as students, you have to treat them as apprentices who have to think in a certain pattern and take it ahead. So I think I end my presentation. We have around 15 minutes for discussions, questions, and uh, certain sources I need to acknowledge for the pictures that I have taken. These are, I need to acknowledge the sources where I've taken my work from. Okay, so uh, we can invite discussions. I'll stop sharing my screen now. Yes, ma'am, we have some questions here. Yes. So the first question is, how was zero symbolized as Shunya? Is there any spiritual connectivity to it? It is, but I will tell you now. Yes, there is. Because, yes, there is history, but I think we'll divert from the theme of today's work. Talking about zero is, is another way because then we'll have to talk about place value and how the concept of Shunya was there. Is zero a placeholder or is it a number? We have to deal in all this. So that's a long, long, uh, uh, not long, but I need at least 15 minutes because, because to do that, I have to first tell you that place value kya hota hai, place holder kya hota hai, or number kya hota hai. In tino ka mujhe thoda sa background batana padega, mein tabhi bata paungi ki zero ko hum place value maante hai, number maante hai, place holder maante hai. Or shunne ya void ko hum kya maante hai. So I... I, there's, I don't think so. I, I would go into that right now because that's getting off the, off the webinar, off the theme of the webinar. Okay. Thank you, ma'am. So, ma'am, the next question is, how to search relevant activities on each and every topic in mathematics, especially for, to? topic, for topics Sorry. such as matrices and determinants? That is what the participant is asking for, especially topic as matrices and determinants. Okay. Uh, so, uh, I think I said this in between that, uh, first of all, you don't have to get into this rat race of finding a real life example to every abstract concept that you're teaching in mathematics. Please remember, mathematics came as an, as an abstract subject. However, coming to your answer on matrices and determinants, there are a lot of real life examples. Matrices and determinants emerge from the idea of symmetry. So class seventh mein jo symmetry padi thi, pehle to matrices and determinants ko wahan connect kar sakte hain. Ki agar aap transformation kar rahe hain, translation kar rahe hain, to wo kaise connect hota hai. To chota example to class seventh se hi connect kar sakte hain. Aapko upar jane ki matab bhoot complicated example dene ki zarurat bhi nahi hai. You can start from simple things that you've already done. Mapping and taking connections from there. And matrices and determinants, uh, you know, to answer a question where you can find well, uh, as I said, there are a lot of things on the internet. Uh, some of the things, I could not access my library in the last seven, eight months, and I'm missing that, but I learned a lot of things from the internet itself. And if you do a sensible search, you will definitely get, there is no, uh, you will definitely, it's like, you know, Bhagwan type se mili jate hain kahin na kahin to. So uh, I, uh, I would say that there are, there are a lot of, uh, uh, so if I go on to answering on matrices, the next question would be on Pythagoras. So I can't list out and I shouldn't be listing out. That's not what I should be doing, that I give you a list of activities with every concept and map it to that. Uh, you will look at it. You will get many answers. Look into the context of your learners. Some of them you may not even like to use it with your learners. Please remember the three points that I shared with you. Context of your learner, age specific and content and then search for an activity for any specific thing that you need, you can email it to me. But first look at internet. Thank you, ma'am. Ma'am, the next question is, which are the best websites to get activity-based examples? Lots. There is Enrich, uh, N-R-I-C-H. Uh, there is NCTM website, it's called Illuminations, which is by NCTM. Uh, 
uh, even yeah so, so, so sorry one minute uh, go to the repository of ncrt i think they have a beautiful connection ncrt ki agar aap website pe jayenge wahan par repository hai unhone bahut sare uh, websites wahan list kiye hue hain ncrt ke bhi aur ncte ki website pe bhi they have created you know something that happened good during this pandemic is lot of organizations and i'm sure your uh, organization would also take a similar exercise they created even we created we created so many things we made a list of so many things on our website uh through you know which we were sharing it with our students so look at ncrt they have a repository of uh, uh websites there and many other many other uh, or, uh educational organizations are doing it and it's just a matter of searching going if you want a collection go on to these authentic government websites government education websites and you will find it ma'am the next question is any books or mathematic uh, magazines or journals that you would like to recommend okay surely uh let me begin with indian uh, there is a beautiful journal by magazine actually or a journal you may call it it's called at right angles uh, it is by azim prem ji university all what you know some of my tessel i've got three articles on tessel in any case you will like that magazine because you know it one it is uh, freely downloadable or from their website it's called at right angles i uh, would highly recommend that magazine because it has lot of resource it's a resource magazine for mathematics teachers it has pedagogical examples even examples it's they have a problem solving session where they're talking about questions as uh, uh, you know for even for olympiads then there are other in india that's that's the magazine that i would like there is a resonance magazine which is also come up there is an organization called mta uh, which is called mathematics teachers teachers association which is also indian these are indian resources homi bhava has brought up lot of stuff homi bhava have their own website they also keep curating stuff and, and uh, then if you go for international magazine there are many by ncte nctm that's called national council of teachers of mathematics they have a lot of magazines related to but they're all paid you know so you'll have to give them a subscription cost and you can subscribe to it. it's called mathematics teacher journal for teaching of mathematics these are some of good journals and magazines but they are all free internationally they are all free thank you ma'am ma'am will take I this as a last to, i forgot to answer i forgot to add vigyan prasad vigyan prasad has also come out lot of repository and lot of things on mathematics many subjects actually yes ma'am ma'am will take this as a last question so ma'am the question is the participant says that he loved the activity of shoelace the shoelace activity and he is asking that how can we relate the shoelace activity to school math combinatorics simple okay ma'am ma'am thank you that's all from my side hello hello yes father yes father uh, i would like to say something uh, from at attending this thing i'm not a mathematics uh, a uh, student or wizard uh, but i learned something very very precious from this which is uh, from all that you presented in terms of the interrelationship or interconnectedness in a multidisciplinary approach uh, to mathematics or using mathematics as a multidisciplinary tool even and that is something which is uh, for me has been something very dear it it has shown to me that there is a harmony in reality it's a blend this interconnectedness or interrelationship is a blend of different subjects different fields of knowledge that makes the whole richer than the individual part that's what i am seeing from whatever you have presented to us how through this through the geometrical shapes blending one another complementing one another complementing different subjects and i think this uh, in a way has to be the goal of uh, all education that it leads us to a situation of understanding that there is an interrelationship and an interconnectedness not only between in different spheres of knowledge but between ourselves that we have to learn 
how to blend with one another and to create a situation of harmony. I think this is what I was seeing in a way through all this uh, blending that you were trying to, to show to us. I think it was very, I mean, very, very perceptive also of you to bring that into real life. How is mathematics related to resolving problems in real life, in whatever fields they are? Can we blend them together so that we have a whole that is not just uh, what you call isolated different parts, but they are all interrelated and blend together to create a beautiful world of harmony for ourselves and for everybody around us with the environment also with ecology also. That is what I learned from what you are saying. So thank you very much, Hanid Gandhi, for giving us these insights. Thank you for yeah, this this aspect. I miss philosophizing mathematics. You added that to it. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Father Blaise D'Souza is our manager, manager of St. Xavier's Institute of Education. And uh, Father Blaze uh, is uh, from the Jesuit community, he's a Jesuit priest. And uh, thank you, Father, for your insight. And it was very motivating that you added these points into the webinar. Uh, so thank you, ma'am, for an excellent session. I think we really enjoyed every bit of it. And the effort you have taken to make those videos so interesting. And, you know, uh, and the small videos, but it was so meaningful and so interesting and we learned so much from those small videos. I keep on telling in every webinar to all the participants that if there is any innovative strategy, please send us a one minute video. But in two minutes also, you have taught us so much. I was asking only for one minute video. If anyone would send us, you know, we give our email ID. So we are also encouraging these small videos through our webinars and uh, we thank you very much. And we go to the next part of um, the session where we conduct a small research, ma'am, and uh, our students will be presenting the results. So quickly, we will be presenting the results of the last research which we have done. So over to Alsona and Vaseem for uh, this session. So the first question of our survey is mathematics is a difficult subject for students and the response for this questions are so there are 39.2 percent people who have agreed for this next question mathematics is abstract so students do not feel connected to the subject so here we can see there are 35.1 percent people who agree on this mathematics consists of problems which gives a negative impact to the students mind so many people disagree on this that is 48.6 percent people the focus of mathematics is rigid and rule bound which does not give flexibility to students which could affect creativity. So there are uh, the there are thirty nine point two percent people who disagree on this. Students are reluctant to spend time and efforts towards mastery of mathematics. So here we can see that forty three point two percent people agree on this. Mathematics as an option for career is not promoted in schools. So 41.9% pe people agree on this. There are too many concepts.
Vaseem, we cannot hear you. Hello. Can you hear me? Yes, yes. So there are too many concepts to remember in mathematics and students feel stressed many times. So 50%, 52% people agree on this. Next question. Mathematics becomes difficult for self-learning and constant assistance is required. So majority of the people agree on this, 41.9%. Teachers themselves do not know of the prospects of mathematics as a subject. So people are neutral on this concept. Over yes, to you uh, also. Yeah, thank you, Vaseem. So the next question is, there is no available literature about mathematics innovations. And we can see that uh, almost 39.2% of participants have disagreed for it. Whereas we have an almost equal number of participants who agree and are neutral about this. The next question, teachers are not promoted to participate in workshops, conferences, or any other professional development activities in mathematics. And we can see that maximum of them, 37.8% uh, respondents have disagreed to it, whereas 24.3% are neutral and 27% agree for this statement. The next, Mathematics Olympiad is promoted in educational institutions and more than 50%, that is around 59.5% respondents have agreed that yes, it is being promoted, whereas almost same number of people are neutral and strongly agree for this as well. Co-curricular activities in mathematics are not encouraged. And we can see that maximum participants, that is almost around 35.1 percent, disagree that uh, disagree and say that co-curricular activities are encouraged. Whereas 29 percent of participants do agree that co-curricular activities are not encouraged. Students are not encouraged to develop creative projects in mathematics. And around 40% people, uh, respondents have agreed for it, that yes, they are not encouraged, but we do have 33.8% respondents who have disagreed. Next, students are not interested in knowing how mathematics can be helpful in vocations. And maximum, uh, uh, maximum percent of respondents, that is 45.9% feel that yes, students are not interested in knowing how mathematics can be helpful in vocations. Next, exhibitions of mathematical products made by students in schools and colleges is not a regular feature. And again, we can see that 45.9% respondents feel that yes, it is not a regular feature. 23% are neutral about it and 16% uh, uh, disagree for this statement. Next, experimentation in mathematics is discouraged in educational institutions. And we have 37.8% respondents agreeing for it, whereas 33.8% people disagreeing for it. And lastly was a open-ended question where we asked up uh, respondents to give opinions about attitude towards mathematics in educational institutions and about importance given to mathematics as a career options. So I have divided the responses. First, let us look at the responses about the attitude towards mathematics in educational institutions. And sadly, the responses were negative. That is very few institutions promote the application of mathematics and relating it to real life scenarios, which makes students feel that mathematics is completely an abstract co concept, which whereas in reality it is not. Mathematics is a very interesting subject, but students don't want to practice it and teachers don't get time to teach maths in class in creative way because they often have a target of completing their portion at a certain period of time. And next, mostly mathematics is uh, portrayed as a very difficult subject meant for geniuses only in schools. And there is no encouragement to explore. Children are not allowed to make mistakes and the focus on teaching maths is more on road learning rather than application. So these responses give the gist of the overall responses that we have received. Next, looking at the importance given to mathematics as a career options, again, we had responses which were negative, that is, as a career, only select schools are interested in doing so. And the reason for that being that the teachers themselves are not versatile 
and creative with maths as a subject, which is why we fail as educators to pass it on to our students. Various competitive exams are conducted by institutions, but again, no career options are discussed in details. And mathematics as a subject is given highest importance compared to other subjects in school. The reason being that it gives many career options, which increases the analytical thinking, develops confidence, improves decision making ability. But the overall uh, view of the responses were that not many institutions promote mathematics as a career option. So these were all the responses. And uh, with this, I end the presentation for the survey that we had. Thank you. Thank you, Alsuna and Vaseem. I now invite Clarice to propose the vote of thanks. Uh, good evening, everyone. So it's my privilege to propose a vote of thanks for SXI Maths Webinar Series 7 2021. On behalf of SXI Manager Father Blaise de Souza, Principal Dr. Susama Samuel, Staff in charge, Dr. Vinnie Sebastian, I extend a hearty vote of thanks to a resource person for the day, Dr. Haneet Gandhi, who spared time from her busiest schedule for this webinar. Today, we have been privileged and had this amazing opportunity to hear your session on teaching mathematics with multidisciplinary perspective. The amazing self-made videos that you use during the session has definitely changed our perspective towards math. I'm sure all the information will help us immensely in our respective fields. So thank you once again, ma'am. Next, I would like to thank our manager, Father Blaise de Souza and our principal, Dr. Susama Samuel, for allowing us to continue with the maths webinar series seven. I would like to thank and appreciate our staff in charge of mathematics pedagogy, Dr. Vinnie Sebastian, for motivating and encouraging us to continue with the webinar series. My heartfelt gratitude to our student coordinators, Alsona, Riesel, Clarice, Rachel, Nisha, and Vaseem for being the strong team behind the curtains and providing technical support. And last but not the least, a big thank you to all your participants for your presence. Without each one and every one of you from Zoom and YouTube, this event wouldn't be successful. We hope that you are taking back something with you from today's session. So once again, thank you for making this event a successful one with your enthusiastic participation. With this, I end my vote of thanks. Uh, now there are some instructions regarding the feedback form. The link is already posted in the chat box of Zoom and YouTube. Please note that later on, no link will be posted in the WhatsApp chats. Feedback form will be open only up to seven. While filling the feedback form, participants make sure that you'll enter the correct email address. If you do not get the certificate, wait for some time, check your spam folder. Even then, if you do not get the certificate, you can contact any one of the student coordinators before seven. Uh, thank you. Now, uh, uh, Vinny, ma'am. Yes, thank you, Clarice. Uh, thank you, everyone, for your participation. So that uh, with that, we end the mathematics webinar series seven. Have a nice weekend and uh, implement the multidisciplinary approach to mathematics teaching. A special thanks to Dr. Haneet Gandhi. Thank you, Dr. Haneet, for your session. Yeah, bye, uh, Dr. Haneet. Thank you very much. Uh, do share the feedback that you get. I'll wait to know. Okay, okay. We will do that. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you for the institute. Thank you, sir. Thank bye, you. Uh, Dr. Sasama, ma'am, you're here. Yeah, I am here. Uh, and thank you so much, uh, Dr. Haneet. Uh, it was really a wonderful session and we have enjoyed it. Actually, we wanted more from you. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, I hope uh, I just yeah. this time. Okay. And, okay. Uh, we, if you have uh, any, if you tell me anything specific and if, I, yeah. if it is within my capacities, I'll definitely see. Okay. Yes, really, we have enjoyed your session. Yes. Dr. Haneet, Madam was appreciating your creativity. 
so uh, ma'am was saying yeah. that um, uh, dr hanit is so creative she was so she was appreciating your creativity yeah yes yeah these were all you know this is what i learned in the in the lockdown period and uh, it the lock, lockdown only helped me to hone this ability of mine to create and you would believe uh, this is these were all done in uh, long time back between till june to september after that i got so busy with admissions that i didn't now again i'll start but i you know i'm going to bring up more videos small little videos only to popularize the aspect i respect the i um, request the participants to subscribe to the channel there are few more there is one particular which i missed was on uh, face mask you know why should you use a particular shape of a face mask uh uh and you know not use the rectangular one i missed that but uh, please can go to now we have to wait uh, can you show now uh, dr hanit at least yes, i sure yes yeah just yeah, yeah, yeah. those who okay. want to yeah. wait yeah okay as, as concluding i think for corona we need to <laughs> yes. i have to wear the face mask yeah, yeah. I, i'll just do that let me just open it yeah sure Give me a minute and this I'll just see it. yes we can see okay this uh, this is also special because you know this idea was shared with me uh, to me with one of the people from jammu region it was uh, his idea and we both of us did this so uh, i just play it hello friends today's episode is dedicated for public awareness we are indeed going through a very rough phase to protect ourselves from covid 19 We need to clean our hands often, maintain a safe distancing, and use a good face mask. Let's talk about face masks today. This idea was shared with me by a teacher from Jammu region. He explains how a conical mask is better than a flat rectangular mask. I like the way he used minimum resources to make his point. Over to him. My salam, Hamar Yunus, teacher, high school, Sindhur, District Punch, J and K. want to share with you the idea how a cup shape custom like um, face mask is better than cylindrical uh, face mask made up of cotton cloth suppose we wear this face mask all do it covers the whole face but the distance between the mouth nose and this face mask is less than as compared to the distance between the mouth nose and face mask of cup like face mask when we exhale air so it stuck with this cloth because the distance between the mouth nose and this cloth is very less as compared to this one and naturally the droplets of water can again come inside go inside the mouth through nose which can cause the, this vital disease let me add a few more points conical mask being curved is less stable for the droplets to stay on the outer surface also owing to its curvedness it fits better on the face creating a seal at the nose and mouth well the basic purpose of a mask is to protect you be it any shape the idea is to wear a clean mask which is hygienic and covers your face entirely when worn properly stay protected and let's pray for the well-being of all So that was it. Very good, very as good. As a finale, as a finale. <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> finale. Very nice. Thank you, thank you, Doctor Hani. Thank you, thank you. Yeah. Thank you so much. So, ma'am, can I end the meeting? Yeah, yeah, yes, I think so. Bye, bye. Yes. Yes. Thank you very much, Doctor Hani.
Yes, sir. Very nice. Very good. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. Uh, welcome to the second session of uh, the guidelines on 